Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in Winning Cures Everything. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. This is college football, uh, what is it, recap, reaction it's show? Heard. I think last yeah. week I did preview, didn't I? <laughs> oh, no, 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 yeah. This they is were reacting. Yeah. Overreacting, we're, appropriately uh, reacting. Yes, just uh, reacting in general to a not great slate, but still pretty entertaining uh, week three. This was uh, this was slow, and this will be the last slow one for a while, I think, because we, we got mean, some big ones. Listen, this Saturday is like pizza, okay? Was it good pizza? No, but it's but it's still better than most anything else you're yeah, going to eat. It's still pizza. You still, still enjoy good. it. Bad pizza so, is still great. There were uh, there were some very entertaining things that went on. Um, do we want to recap our our bets? We we went a combined eight and four in Not our. Too shabby. Yeah, that, we did okay. We're we're finally getting the hang of this season. We're figuring out some of these teams. Yeah. Some of them I, still I, make no sense, right? Yeah. I uh, I won one last week, which I needed desperately on a uh, kind of a last minute, put it in your ear by A and M to uh, to give me a, a, a kind of a garbage time cover, and yeah. uh, I lost I lost one this week with the same thing with Florida to uh, to take me from going four and zero. Oh. So it, it will typically even out. So you went three and one, I went five and three, uh, if only because Troy for whatever reason, could not stop that kick returner from Southern Miss. <laughs> just I mean, Southern Miss is a decent football team. They're not yeah. terrible. No, no, they're not terrible at all. But, I, man, if if you would have told me that Southern Miss was going to put 47 up on anybody, I mean, that just – that that makes no sense to me. So there were some, there were some crazy things. Uh, as always, go over to winningcureseverything.com. Check out what we got going over there. Of course, this week's picks contest still going on because we've got the NFL – Today on Sunday, we're recording this Sunday morning. Um, a lot of stuff going on. You you can go over there, check out our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Maybe some uh, some more special things, whatever going on on the Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we will we will figure that out because we we want to add some more content. But we'll Chris and I will discuss that and figure out exactly how we want to go about it. Uh, as always, sign up for the newsletter. Got a lot of things over there. We send it out once a week. Uh, we are riding over 515 subscribers right now. Not too shabby on that. Uh, numbers are always going up. We appreciate you guys sharing out the show. If you're on the podcast, listening on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, whatever your favorite podcast app is, go and leave us a review. Five stars, uh, written review. Tell everybody about it. We really do appreciate it. Um, We'll read it out on the show this week. We uh, we got you know some pretty good reviews in last week, and we were super happy about it. Somebody talked about how Chris uh, gives some very passionate rants basically every show, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have another one this morning. But <laughs> but that's what they're, Chris they're, does, and I love it. And they're, uh, they're organic. Yeah, they're very not, organic. They're not rehearsed, I assure you. <laughs> how I really feel. Yeah, you got that right. And, of course... The show is always brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. They've got six incredible sports books. I actually went down to three of them on Friday night, got some bets in, uh, hit some winners, felt good about that. But you can find more information on that over at tunicatravel.com. I'm telling you, you want to go down there. It's a good time. I had fun Friday night watching North Carolina Wake Forest, watching Kansas Boston College, and the beginning of Washington State Houston. So it's a good time. Go check them out, tunicatravel.com, and us over at winningcureseverything.com. Chris, let's jump in. I, I want to start off with Elastico. Iowa 18, Iowa State 17. Lightning delay meant that the second quarter didn't get started until after 6 p.m. Central Time. And this game started at 3 p.m. This was... Just a shade it, under a 10-hour game. It was mayhem. Absolute mayhem. I don't think it was 10 hours. I think it ended at like 9 p.m. Yeah, or, I mean, that's, that's an exaggeration. So, but so it, it, I mean, but a, even still, that's that's what, uh, over over six hours? And yeah. nobody left that game. That was, it, rarely do you see a big, big rivalry game that has such a, a long weather delay. But this was crazy. Uh, Iowa State 
had two turnovers. Iowa had none. Iowa has not turned, and they made sure you knew this in the broadcast, <laughs> Iowa has not turned the football over in this game since 2015. That's incredible. That's just, it, that's Kirk Ferentz. It, if it. you, it, it's not beating yourself, and that's just the easiest way yeah, to win games. I was just about to say, just don't make mistakes. Yeah, Iowa kicked the game-winning field goal with four minutes and fifty-one seconds left. Both quarterbacks had bad moments, uh, but they were impressive. Brock Purdy, uh, twenty-four out of thirty-four, two hundred seventy-six yards, one touchdown. He had nine rushes for thirty-four yards. Nate Stanley on the other side, twenty-two out of thirty-five, two hundred and one yards, seven runs, eleven yards with one touchdown. At the end of this game, though, Brock Purdy and his throw on fourth down, that was awful. And it's the reason why I bet Iowa. Now, they didn't cover for me. But the reason why I bet Iowa here is Iowa always has a really, really good defense. And Brock Purdy, against the two best defenses that he had faced last year, which were the only ones that were comparable to Iowa, he just wasn't good. He had a completion percentage of like 56%, and he looked rattled, etc. In this game, he did not look rattled initially. But once the pressure got cooked up a little bit and they no longer had the lead, he looked like a different quarterback. He did not perform as well under pressure. Now, they did get him down the field and whatnot. Uh, the ending of this game, you know, they get that, or they, they go forward on fourth down, they don't get it, and Iowa. Runs it three times, punts the ball, and Iowa State drops the football, which was a killer. All in all, though, super entertaining football game. Even for a low-scoring game, this was there was it was pressure packed. It was fantastic to watch. It was two great coaches that were maneuvering basically the whole game. Did did you try and watch this entire thing? No, well, not the whole thing. I kept coming in and out of it just just based on what else was going on. Yeah, um, we didn't and, intend and, on it being a night game, right? <laughs> no, I wasn't. I wasn't expecting it to last as long as it did. Um, I mean, this is this is the reason Kurt Ferentz is the longest tenured head coach in college football. Like, he is just really good at doing everything you're expected to do. Are they ever going to have one of these exceptional offenses? I, I don't know. I don't know that they're ever going to be the team to put up 40 and 50 a game. Okay. But I know this, they're going to run the ball. They're going to play great defense on a regular basis, and they are not going to have a bunch of penalties or turnovers to cause them to lose games. Yeah. And that means they're incredibly difficult to beat. Yeah. They're, they're just insanely always going to be a thorn in your side. And the further that we get away from it, um, from everybody running the same kind of thing, you know, when when Ferentz was going through his six and six, seven and five years, there were more people doing the same thing as him and maybe doing it better with better athletes. Oh, yeah. As we get away from because you see the other teams that are that are moving away from it, right? Alabama can't run the football anymore, it doesn't feel like, uh, at least not, you know, just pound the rock, right? They can't do that because they they're, have switched to more to finesse. Slow down these massive offensive teams. Yeah, these these teams that are more tempo based, etc. As you get away from that, that actually makes Iowa better because people don't see it. it it's kind of like when people would run up against the triple option, right? right? And it's not that they run the triple option, they just run a pro style set. I was going to say they just run a standard pro style offense. But how many people in college still run that? Nobody. Exactly. Nobody. And that's what makes Iowa a little bit better at it. And it's what makes Iowa State, honestly, uh, a Big 12 contender. Because they are so different from everybody else that is in that league. Everybody else wants to run pace. They want to run tempo. They want to get their wide receivers out in space. They want to do all this. And not that Iowa State doesn't want to do that. But Iowa State can still run the football and they can still play defense. And well, yeah, nobody else in the Big 12 have, does it. Iowa State knows they don't have the dudes to do that. They don't have the talent that Oklahoma and Texas have. Like, they, yeah. they just don't. And so if they try to run with those guys and beat them at their own game, they get beat every time. Yeah, the you, only way to beat them and to hang with them and to be in the conversation with those other teams that are better talented than you is to, is to be unconventional. And what's strange is this old – 
offense that was the standard in the NFL. So reasons called a pro style offense. It was the league standard for 20 years. I mean, it's it's not like we're talking about I formation and 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 just slow old timey wing T stuff. We're talking about a really good pro offense that can still put up points. It just looks different than than the way everybody else does it, and it takes different level of talent um, to do this. You got to have athletic tight ends, big strong tight ends. You got to have athletic offensive linemen. These spread options offenses that these RPOs they don't have to build offensive linemen at all. No, because because you're pass blocking or run blocking for maybe two seconds, and that's it. The ball comes out so fast and so quick, and it's always going to a sideline or a slant, and and it doesn't matter. They're just all short, efficient passes. You don't have to know how to pass block. It's the reason NFL is is dying for some type of uh, developmental league for strictly for one position, offensive line. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Uh, the, the biggest thing, you and I talked about this last week, you know, you bring up unconventional Uh with Iowa State, teams like that that are going against teams that have more talent, the less plays that are in a game, the better odds you have. So running a, a slower tempo is actually better for some of these teams because you when you give better athletes more plays in order to make plays, that means they got more chances to be great. And if you limit those ch- uh, those touches, those chances, you know, instead of an offense getting... 90 to 100 plays a game, well, you cut them down to 50 or 60, that is 40 less opportunities for one of these five stars to go bananas. That's right. And and that works out well for teams like this. So I, this was a fantastic game. Uh, I would not recommend maybe going back and watching it unless you love defense, unless you love that kind of thing, right? <laughs> Let's uh let's move on from that. We spent enough time on uh, on Elasico. Let's uh let's move into Florida State and Virginia. Now I know that this wasn't a massive game, but I'm gonna pull up a, a quote and we'll we'll talk about what happened here. Virginia thirty one, Florida State twenty four. The ending was awful coaching. Absolutely awful. Florida State was up seventeen to ten at the end of the third quarter, and Virginia came out on offense in the fourth quarter and had three drives of 70-plus yards each that all ended in touchdowns. They scored 21 points in the fourth quarter after scoring 10 for the first three quarters combined. Florida State's defense was gassed. They didn't know what was going on. And even with all of that, Florida State was still down 31 to 24 with the ball driving late in the game and got two massive penalties that kept their drive alive. That I mean fourth down calls with roughing the passer, they got a pass interference call, they had no timeouts left in the game. They end up getting a first and goal from the the 4 yard line, I believe it was, maybe the 3. That's and we've got Sook in here again. <laughs> um but yeah, we we Get down to the four-yard line, and Florida State, rather than clocking the ball and giving themselves an opportunity to line something up, they decide instead to just line up Cam Akers, you know, their their all-star running back, in the Wildcat from the three to try and run the ball into the end zone. But nobody was really set. Nobody seemed to know what was going on. And rather than clock the ball and get organized, because they had time. The clock was stopping because of the first down. Yep. They had time to clock the ball. And I just, I, I don't understand it. This is the quote that Willie Taggart gave, okay? He said, well, I didn't call the plays. Kendall called the plays. He had the play called, and we just didn't get it done. I would love for you to comment on this, because I know how you feel about about head coaches yeah, I, that do I, I this. Share, I share that I share that tweet out and I commented on it on Twitter. Yeah. Um this morning when I saw it. I just and, and it's just very simple. I just cannot believe a head coach would that would be his comment. That would be yeah. what he would say at the end of a loss. Um I feel very strongly about this because from the age of like 24, 25, I was given my first managerial job a, 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 in a business and 
And rule number one of managing a, a finish line, a shoe store, and then went to like a local restaurant. And as I worked my way up through life, managing a ton of different people and different things, there's one simple rule of leadership. And it's the very first rule. In a loss, when something goes wrong, whoever is in charge takes full responsibility publicly. You can, you can go to the locker room and you can rip whoever you have to rip. You can fire whoever you have to fire. You do whatever you have to do to correct it behind closed doors. But publicly, out front, you take the loss. When you win, you give all the credit to the team. That, that, is, that is the very first thing I was taught in management. When you have somebody who does something well, you, you parade them out in front of the entire team and you publicly embrace them and, and celebrate them. When somebody does something wrong, you say nothing about it openly and you behind closed doors, you correct and, and you do those things. Willie Taggart can't seem to figure this out, and it drives me insane. He's not the only coach, by the way, that throws other people under the bus. Oh, yeah. But to come out and say, I don't take responsibility. I didn't call the plays. I don't call our plays. That's Kendall's job. I don't know I don't know what's going on. I'm not going to answer your question on why we did this or why yeah, we did it's, that. It's not my responsibility. How the hell is it not your responsibility? You're the he head coach. Has the, the, he is the overall leader of the football team. He has veto power. He it, can it say, just drives block me this insane. thing. Now, I can see it from, from a different perspective, right? If I want to play devil's advocate and say, okay, the reason that they called this was they were trying to catch Virginia off guard because Virginia's expecting us to clock it and do this, but, but you have a better chance of getting yourself organized. You have a better chance of scoring when you are organized and when your team knows what is happening. Not that you had any timeouts to be able to actually get in there and do anything to to set uh, it, but but to get everybody set up so that they understand what their job is right in that moment. My, None of my, them like looks like it doesn't. It doesn't matter if it worked or not, and it doesn't like it. Just one of those things where you lose the game when you're asked about oh, yeah. it. Yeah, you you just say take it was my responsibility fault. and move on. Just say it was chaotic at the end. I didn't get it done. And, and we're going to figure this thing out. You give the standard coach speak that you're supposed to give, and then whatever you have to do at the end, you know, you, you correct it later. I just can't – I can't believe that was his answer, which is why I don't call the plays. Don't ask now, me about the play call because I don't call the plays. Now, Jim Levitt was brought in as a defensive assistant, like a defensive analyst. Right. He was probably he, like in the middle of the week, though, wasn't he? Yeah, middle he, of the week. It, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying he had anything to do with this, but uh, what I am saying is how do you feel the chemistry is between that coaching staff? Obviously, it was really bad last year. I and don't know that it's any better. I don't think it's any I I don't think that Taggart is happy with any of his guys, and I don't know that any of the guys that are there are happy with what Taggart is doing. Like, this is a complete dumpster fire. They only lost by seven on the road to a really good Virginia team. They've got talent. They don't have, I think, the right guys in the right places. They definitely don't have the leadership. I mean... When leadership refuses to take personal responsibility, nobody under them will ever take personal responsibility, which means you're going to have a coaching staff and a locker room full of people pointing the fingers at someone else. Yeah. And 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 you you have anarchy and nothing but destruction and chaos from there. Anything good that happens in that situation is is all an accident. A blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then. But other than that, it's going to be nothing but chaos and destruction. Yeah. Because these people are not going to change. They're not going to change their stripes. If they're not man enough to take personal accountability now when, when it's hard, then, then they're never going to do it. They're just never going to do it. Now, that being said, as bad as this team is, they could still move into – Make uh, a bowl game? They could still make the, a bowl game. They could still yeah. end up like 7-5. and five. That's the next topic. Topic number three, the ACC's weird, awful weekend – so, I, <laughs> along with the Florida State Virginia ending and everything else, Wake Forest twenty four, North Carolina eighteen. Uh, it was a non conference game. Sam Howell, 
it seems on this to, weekend, it's what matters. Yeah, it, it Sam Howell for whatever reason. Well, really, just anybody for North Carolina doesn't want to do anything until the second half. I guess uh, it, it makes no sense to me. Like I, when I left to go down to the sports books on Friday night, it was twenty-one to nothing Wake Forest at the half, and I sent you the screenshot, right? It, yep. You and the uh, the West Lot Pirates guys. I sent y'all the screenshot of the first half stats, and North Carolina had done nothing. Absolutely not. Well, in the second half, Wake Forest did nothing. Like, they got a field goal in the second half. It was ridiculous. But the ACC came out Saturday morning and just kind of swept this under the rug, and they said, yeah, there should have been one second left on the clock. If you didn't see the end of that game, it was absolutely insane. But there was one second left on the clock when North Carolina's player ran out of bounds, and they would have had a shot at a Hail Mary to, and, and a reasonable shot. I mean, they, they were down at the 35-40 yard line. Like, so they had a shot there, but uh, the ACC screwed that one up, their officiating committee, uh, in a non-conference game that absolutely means nothing to the ACC standings, which is still the weirdest thing maybe have having been scheduled ever. I, it's, I don't understand it. Kansas, 48, Boston College, 24. We're going to get more into that here in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, Boston College, not good. Pitt loses to Penn State, 17-10. to 10. It, let's, let's discuss this for two seconds. Okay, before we get into some of the other scores. Pitt was down by seven with about four minutes left in this game. And they get the ball to Penn State's one-yard line. Now, did you watch this? Yep. Okay. Well, because I've got, I've got Pitt, and I've got yeah. the entire world on YouTube telling me how big of a moron I am. Yeah, I know, right? Penn State's going to beat them by 40, which those, those guys are all wrong and yeah, I, your boy was right. So, yep, okay. your boy was right. Yep, you're right. I'm all in this game. <laughs> uh, so Pitt gets down there on the one yard line, fourth and goal from the one. I don't with, understand this. With four minutes left, with a chance to tie the game. With a with a chance to tie the game because they're only down seventeen to ten, <laughs> and Pat Narduzzi chooses to kick a nineteen yard field goal. So here are the the different options here. You can go for it, and you score the touchdown, and you can tie the game, sure. in which case you you give Penn State time to go down the field and score, or whatever. But either way, the game would be tied rather than you being down. If you don't get the touchdown, Penn State gets the ball on their own one-yard line. With and a, you play great defense all game. With a super the inexperienced offense that has not really done a ton in this game, right? No. That's the other the other option is you kick a field goal from a bad angle that your kicker has a a greater than zero chance of missing anyway which still puts you in the same position but Penn State gets the ball on the 20. There, this should never be a question. You have to go for that 100 times out of 100. And his reasoning, and now check this out. Did you see that he doubled down on this after the game? No, I didn't. I, I, when, I, when that game was over, I was just glad to get the ticket cash to move Narduzzi, on. to the media afterwards, said, well, we were going to have to score twice to win the game anyway, so I wanted to go ahead and take the points. But couldn't you score in overtime? I was like just you- about to say, if you <laughs> – God almighty, these coaches. I just – I cannot – when I was – as a child, I I used to think everybody coaching at this level was was just a football genius, no. and and they all knew every aspect of all this game and the difference between the best and the worst was almost nothing, and it all was all about the talent. The, there's a reason that all I do in college is follow coaches because I, I just believe that that is where the consistency is. In a sport in which the kids turn over every couple of years, you you just follow the smartest, brightest, and the hardest working guys. Yeah. And consistently you'll do better than, than if you don't. Okay? I, I'm, I'm with you. There's um, one of the reasons why I had Pitt being one of the worst teams in college football this year before the season started. Okay? It, it's because these guys are morons. They're, they're just idiots. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Like that, that type of logic has to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Well, you got a chance to tie the game in a massive rivalry game 
or kick a field goal and still be down by four in a game in which you've only scored twice already anyway. Exactly. What, and then was that it, field goal uh, was doesn't it, help you win anyway. So it's not two scores. you got to score twice to win. It's you have to score a touchdown at some point in time to win. Yes. And and your best chance will be from the one-yard line. <laughs> from the one-yard line! Uh, it, it was a Clay Travis that said that that the majority of college football coaches are really, if they didn't have college football coaching jobs, they would just be PE teachers at a high school. Yes, like that'd and, be and about the best thing they could do. And I completely agree. And that that that's kind of an insult to a lot of PE teachers out there. <laughs> I mean, folks right. that think these guys would be CEOs of major firms because they're they're so competitive. And they're so just because you're look, there's a lot of people that, that are out in this world that are really competitive that are also really dumb. Yeah. Okay. They're just, they're just not smart. You know what they're good at? They're good at going to the Y and, and playing and playing pickup basketball because 100%. they've got their competitive team. They just don't have any skills. A hundred percent. Continuing on with the ACC with their weird, awful weekend. West Virginia 44, NC State 27. NC State. It had looked okay, but West Virginia, uh, Neil Brown finally got that thing figured out, and this was a team that could not score in the first two weeks against James Madison, and then they went and got beat by 31 at Missouri last week, and NC State goes into Morgantown and gets almost a 50-burger dropped on them. Uh, they lose by 17. Virginia Tech, 24, Furman, 17. This was a 17-3 to ball game at one point. Uh, no, 14 to 3, wasn't it? Uh, e- either way, they were down big, and it was turnovers. It was all sorts of different stuff that uh, that happened there. Citadel 27, Georgia Tech 24. It it kind of makes you question okay, how bad is South Florida if they just went in last week and got beat up by Georgia Tech? And then the I Citadel hate, comes I in. I hate that circular. I know. The tra- the, 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 because uh, with, with, yeah, with. I know. That's just bad logic. Yes, I understand. I understand, but it's it's still it's still there, right? It's like Citadel went in and beat them in overtime. It Georgia Tech; those players know what the triple option is. How in the world could you not stop it? That's just it. it, it it's crazy to me. It's crazy to me. Uh, and then finally, of course, the last one: the Clemson forty-one, Syracuse six. Syracuse was the. Uh, the next guy up behind Clemson, everybody thought they might have an opportunity. Clemson absolutely boat raced them, and I'm telling you, that last touchdown just killed me. That's I didn't have a ton on it, but when that line got up to Syracuse plus 28, I went ahead and took it, yeah, and yeah, I mean it just just ridiculous. So, but I, I will say this: even with Clemson winning like they are, it's the same thing with. Alabama with LSU with whoever like I heard a really good analogy by the way so Clemson goes 15 and0 last year right and Florida State back in 2013 they win the BCS title they are everybody's darlings they don't lose anybody off the team they come back and the next year they just dream state walk through. The rest of the season. They come back in games that they have to come back in, but they don't really play anybody. It's not a difficult schedule, et cetera, et cetera. Well, then they go undefeated, get into the playoff with a third seed, but don't look good all year, and then they get absolutely steamrolled by Oregon. Yep. Clemson kind of looks like the same thing. I mean, Trevor Lawrence had good numbers, but two more interceptions for him? I mean, that puts him at five on the year. That's more than he had all of last year. And look at the defenses he's doing it against. Yeah, I mean and, these these are not these are not great schemed defenses or great talented cornerbacks out there. Okay, no, this, this is, is just not that. This is complacency. I, I, I absolutely think that's that has potential to happen. Now, the best thing that can happen to Clemson is nobody jump them. Okay, which a people are going to say I'm just taking shots at Clemson, but but I'm not. If they go undefeated, which they're going to go undefeated through the rest of the schedule, oh, yeah. there is a world in which they could have zero wins against the top 25 team. If A&M loses four games this year with their really tough schedule. But, and we'll see what happens with A&M when, against Auburn next week. When, when the season is over, if A&M's not ranked, they won't have a win against a single ranked opponent. Yeah. 
And can you have them one or two if that's the case? I don't care what they did last year. I don't care that they're the champs until you beat them. It, if they don't play a ranked team all year, all year, then then I just don't know that you can justifiably have them one or two. And I almost don't care what the other records are of the other teams. You can have a two-loss SEC team or a, or a two-loss Big Ten team get in. And that's fine. That's fine. This Those will be, teams are battle tested and they deserve to be ranked higher than you. They this, just they just do. This will be an interesting case study to see what happens with a team like UCF, right? That's right. You can't look at UCF's schedule and say they ain't played nobody and so therefore they don't belong. And then look at what Clemson's doing and say they ain't played nobody. They don't belong. Yeah. Because they're, they're UCF the schedule same. The year that they claim the national championship, that schedule is going to be harder than what they're going to have this year. Yeah. I, I assure you of that. If you look at their strength of schedule when the season's over with, UCF schedule will be harder than what Clemson's schedule is going to be at the final year. They need to hope and beg that AM finishes in the top 10, that AM rips off a win against Alabama, yeah. they rip off a win against LSU or Georgia, or, or they need to win two of those games and be in the top 10 when it's over. Yeah, you got that right. And they need Syracuse to do something. Like, it, right. d- stop looking like what they're looking like right now. That's right. Uh, to go on and close out this ACC, and we'll have to run through the rest of these fairly quickly, this is the 2019 record against Power 5 teams. Okay, I'm going to roll through it. Big 12 is 6-3 and three against other Power 5s. The SEC, 5-4 and four against other Power 5s. Big 10, 4-4. Four and four. Pac-12, 3-3. Three and three. The Mountain West is 7-9 and nine against the Power 5. The American is 4 and 10. The ACC is 2 and 7 against other Power 5 teams or Power 5 conferences. Pretty pretty terrible. Let's move into number 4 here. Arizona State 10, Michigan State 7, and did your boy call this one or did he call this one? Now I thought the Michigan State would win the game. Because I thought at home it's it's one thing, and they'll win it close. But there's no way Herm Edwards is losing by two touchdowns. It's not happening. And quarterback Jaden Daniels was fantastic. He wasn't great all game because these are two really good defenses. But man, he led a 75 yard touchdown drive for a 10 to seven lead with 50 seconds left on the clock. Michigan State drives 50 yards in 38 seconds. There's 12 seconds left on the clock. The kid hits a 42-yard field goal. And tell me me this. When did the rule change about illegal participation? I thought that it was a 15-yard penalty for if you play with 12 guys on the field. But it was if it's an illegal substitution, like you don't get a guy off the field in time or whatever, then it's only a 5-yarder. But... If you go back and look, Michigan State played the play with with 12 guys on the field. I don't know that that matters. That just all depends on where the refs call the foul. Well, that's right. Like, why should you be penalized more if the refs don't catch it until the play is over than if they catch it before the play starts? Well, that's no, 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 because that it, needs to be changed. I'm not a fan of that. It can't be one way if the refs catch it and another way if they don't catch it. No, 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 no. It's if you if you play with twelve. In the past, it has always been that's a fifteen yard penalty. And if but if you I understand what you're saying, yeah. Gary. But if they, my, if you got a guy running off the is, field, is I'm not a like I, that doesn't make any sense. Well, no, I think the rule now is it's just a five yard penalty either way. I, I think that's I think that's right. I think so that's, that's how it needs. That's the to way be. it goes okay now. But I, but that's what I was trying to figure out is, and I'm not saying that it didn't need to be changed. I'm just saying it used to be a 15-yarder, which would have made this a 57-yard field goal for him to retry as opposed to a 47-yard field goal, which would have been ridiculously impossible, right? So, but either way, he comes out, they've got, they hit the field goal, they've got 12 on the field, they have to come back out and kick it from 47, and he completely shanks it, just way, way over uh, to his left, and Arizona State goes out 
with a win in a game where Michigan State had 404 total yards to Arizona State's 216. This is the weirdest. If you look at box scores. Oh, yeah. Like if there was back in the day when friends and family of mine that I knew were in the uh, wagering business before it might have been legal. Um, <laughs> they, they, they literally, they get the USA Today and they just they just did everything through box scores. And that's how they kind of did their analysis on what teams were. And I mean, I was kind of taught at a young age. You don't always look at the scores when you're preparing for next week. Yeah. You look at how teams performed because sometimes there's nobody that would have looked at that box score and been like, wait, what? This this team lost and this team won? Oh, yeah. That doesn't make sense. Like, at Michigan State, no possible way that happened. Michigan State had one turnover. Arizona State had none. Michigan State missed two field goals. Uh, Arizona State was not able to do anything most of the day, but this Jaden Daniels kid has got – Ice water in his veins, whatever cliche thing you want to say. He is the real deal. He's a true freshman. He was the number two quarterback in last year's class at 247, and he went to Arizona State, and he won out the starting job. And Herm Edwards, that's a dude. Like, I think that this thing is actually going to work with him. People laughed at it. Now we laughed but, at it. We did yeah. people. We we'll say people. But uh, no, we laughed at it. But it's, you and me laughed at it. But everybody was laughing at it. No, and, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can't even listen. You uh, take responsibility. Yeah. We laughed at it. We were wrong. Her, we were, her, yeah, we were dead wrong. We were, we were way dude, wrong about this. But yeah. I, I was right at least on this game because I knew he wasn't going to lose by two touchdowns to Sparty. Period. So let's move on from that one. Let's go to... The Big Ten non-conference losses. All right. How you feel about that? Um, we rolled through them. Eastern Michigan 34, Illinois 31, and this was not a fluke. Eastern Michigan outgained them uh, by, you know, 80-some-odd yards and was able to throw the ball all day on them. Illinois still not back in the bowl game business. Uh, after that, Temple 20, Maryland 17. And do we want to talk about that? I'm going to talk about the AAC Okay. Well, you know what? We're going to talk about it right now. Maryland, 5 out of 21 on third downs. Temple had three turnovers. Maryland only had one. And Temple demolished these guys. Like, was able to slow down this offense. It was uh, it was fun to watch. No, I mean, it was rainy. It was a couple other things. but Physically imposed their will against yes. Maryland defensively. The, the they same just- thing happened last year and this you remember uh we were in our little group chat we talked about this and i brought up like let's not crown maryland just yet i know they got dudes but they looked really yeah, good through two games about not crowning them because last year around week five or week six they fell off not week three they fell off against Temple. No, okay. I, I said they it in there. They got into Big Ten play. It was the same thing last year, though. They looked really good. They beat Texas, and then they looked really good against an also-ran. And then week three last year, when Temple came in and absolutely gave them the business, because Temple had come off losses to Villanova and Illinois State or something. I mean, it, it, yeah, it was something bad. It was something really yeah, bad. I remember. Really yeah, bad. Remember. And they were 0-2 and looked like garbage and came in and housed them 35-14 to in College Park. And now it's the same thing. Like, they didn't house them this time, but they, that offense was slowed way down. They looked super confused, didn't know what was going on. At, this was a very interesting thing to watch. Uh, because when the pressure got on, and that fourth down stop uh, with what no time left on the clock, basically, that was uh, that was something else. Uh, to decide to run the ball there was, I mean, you're running right into the strength of Temple's defense. It was just ridiculous. So yeah, so Temple gets a win over Maryland. That's uh, not a good thing for the Big Ten. Um, along with that, TCU 34, Purdue 13. And yeah, of course, nothing, we already talked about to, Arizona that's State. Nothing to wag a finger at, though. Yeah, wait, say what? That's nothing to wag a finger at, though. And no. Listen, Gary Patterson's got some dudes, and and they're coming off a bad season. I had a feeling they were going to be f- playing some hard football this year. Oh yeah. Now I will say this: Purdue without Elijah Sindelar. Yes. Uh, there were a lot of people that thought that this would make Purdue a little bit better. I don't think it did. 
But no, I don't think no, anything would have made them better in this game. No. I mean, TCU was just head, heads and shoulders better than Purdue was in all aspects of the game. Gary Patterson. Yeah. It's exactly what I expect from Gary Patterson. No, you got that right. So, and like I said, of course, Arizona State beats Michigan State. That's not good for Sparty to be losing at home to a Pac-12 team that isn't expected to do very well. But, I mean, who knows? They, they could end up being really, really good. Uh, let's move into number six here. After the Big Ten goes through their, their mess, let's talk about Les Miles being back. He is back, baby. You got the win. You called this one. And I, I liked your pick because, I mean, it was 82% of the money and the bets were on Boston College to cover. That that line was ridiculous. But 48-24, yep. to 24, it, here, let me give you the stats. Come on. Kansas, 567 yards of offense. Boston College, 447. Kansas had one turnover. Boston College had zero. Kansas with 329 rushing yards. You had 11 rushes for 187 from Khalil Herbert. He also had a touchdown. And then Puka Williams had a touchdown and 22 carries for 121 yards. This was a butt whipping. This wasn't a fluke. This this wasn't the ball bounced crazy a couple of times or, or they got one matchup that they couldn't. This was all aspects of the game. Kansas destroyed Boston College. And that ain't a good look for the ACC, like we talked about earlier. Your boy's back. Hey, man, I don't, I don't know how back he is. I know this. I've seen this man coach too long. I know when you're talking about a bounce back situation, coming off a bad loss, you let him take his team on the road. They get away from home. They get away from all the distractions. They get away from all the the naysayers of a losing program, just with their heads down, feeling like they're beat. Let's go on the road. Let's go into a hostile environment, and that's where we're going to come together. I've watched him do it for too damn long. He's too good of a coach. He's too good of a motivator. He's going to find a way. I love this man so much. I like the way just people buy in to what he's selling. He makes you believe in yourself more than anyone I've ever seen. And and I'm, I'm just – I don't know what Kansas is going to be at the end of this year. But I I knew this week they weren't going to get their ass whooped. Okay, I, no, I, can, I just, I, I'm with I just you. couldn't see it. This was the first road win over a Power Five team since 2007. It had been 12 years since Kansas went on the road and beat anybody of substance. Uh, and we'll talk about this at the end of the the night. But it's the first time since 2006 that both Kansas State and Kansas had road wins against Power Five teams on the same day. So. Moving on from Les Miles and your Rock Chalk Jayhawks now. Number seven, Florida 29, Kentucky 21. Would you like to comment before I say anything about this game? No, so I, as soon as Felipe Franks goes down, I'm watching every second of this game, and, and you and the guys on our group text are, are kind of in and out and doing their other things. And – and as soon as Felipe Franks goes down, I immediately respond with, we have a situation in Kentucky, and you never want to see somebody get hurt. But while Felipe Franks was quarterbacking this team, and I don't mean to say something negative or bad about a guy that got hurt as part of the game sometimes, but I, I never once worried about my bet, and I thought Kentucky had a strong opportunity to win this game. And as soon as Felipe goes down, I immediately got worried. Because I always felt for a long time, whoever's behind him just didn't get a chance. Just didn't get a chance. And as soon as they get a chance, this Florida team's got talent. And I think he was the governor on that engine that was pulling it back and holding it down. Not that he can't make plays, but he's just going to give the ball to the other team too many times. Or or and, just make really bad decisions with the football. Well, that's and, it. That's and, it. And, and, and make I mean, more bad. And if you've got a guy like, Kyle Trask, it, here's here's the situation. UK was up 21 to 10 in the third quarter. And dominating the game. Dominating, dominating the, game. the football game. Yeah, when, when Felipe Franks went down with that injury, which was ugly. I mean, I, I, I couldn't even go back and watch it. On ESPN. They, yeah. they refused to replay it, which, which I like. Yeah, that was, that was good. So, enter Kyle Trask, who went 9 out of 13 for 126 yards. He had 
no touchdowns passing, but he had one quarterback sneak that went one yard for a touchdown. He moved uh, the offense just so much more efficient. Yes, because he, he didn't make bad decisions. He knew exactly where to go with the football. He just followed the game plan. There was no uh, there was no coming up with you know creativity plays, right? Like it it wasn't anything like that. It was just follow the script. And you've got more talent than these guys, so follow the script and you will be able to win. So Florida goes up 22 to 21 before 11 left. UK drives to the Florida 22, calls three straight runs, and then Chance Poor misses a 35 yard field goal that would have won the game. That's that's bad coaching. So of of course, to get into your bad beat for the weekend, you had Kentucky plus seven and a half. They're down by one. If they make the field goal, they're up by two with what, 30 seconds left, whatever it is. Yep. Um, I read, no, I think it was like 50 seconds. Either way. Whatever. But I can't lose. You, you, you can't just, lose at that, that point. Game. And instead, they missed the field goal. after They moved the ball down the field by throwing the football. And right. they had timeouts. Yes, sir. Why would you not continue to be aggressive once you get down inside the 25-yard line? That we, makes we talk, no sense to me why coaches do that. Especially yeah, with talking, a red shirt freshman kicker. Yeah. And and and, and no besmirching to the to the kicker, but that's a terrible kicker name. Like like you know yeah, how I feel poor. about you know how I feel about <laughs> karma and signs and just like the the world telling me things. There's no way on earth I would allow a, a kicker, somebody who has to be accurate, kicker, quarterback, something of that nature, that I would never recruit that guy or allow them to be on my team with the name of Chance Poor. Yeah. Chance? No, no, we're not. We're not doing this. All right. No, you're either legally changing your name or you're 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 kicking somewhere else. Or we're just gonna call you something else. Not 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 on my team. And we're putting a different name on your jersey. Yeah. Like like this is not happening. Yeah. I, be- I believe that you get confidence in who you are by knowing who you are. You grew up with the last name of Poor. No, you don't get to be accurate. No. No. And so, but as far as not being aggressive, I understand Kentucky had a backup quarterback. They, he was they, playing they, good. They, he was yeah. playing fine. Was he deadly accurate? No. Was no. he everything you wanted? But Sawyer but was, Smith had really been able. Good. He had been able to move the offense at Troy last year. Like he's yeah. he's good. He's gonna be fine. No, nope, he's uh, gonna be fine. Just irritating as as can be. Lots of lots of red shirt freshmen in college football had an opportunity Saturday, and lots of them played really well. Yeah. I mean, so, this is definitely a young man's game now. So you're I mean, your bad beat, right? Let's talk about your bad beat for two seconds. Josh Hammond. It, Florida runs into the line two straight times. Florida's Kentucky just trying calls to kill the, the clock. They're just, just trying to kill the clock. Trying to kill the game. clock. And even even Dan Mullen, after this happened, they, yeah. they run an end around because if you get a first down, the game is over. That's right. You kneel it. But the play was you run the end around, you get the first down, you go down. That's right. And instead, Josh Hammond the takes the end around 76 yards for a touchdown with 33 seconds left, which leaves time on the clock and Florida only up by eight, which is an idiotic play by the Florida player because it left time on the clock and it kept it a one score game. And two, why? Why? Like, just. <laughs> Because he saw the end zone. He, he saw the end zone. He wanted it. I understand Look, that you I want to score. But I get it. I, I'm man. not mad at the kid for scoring. I mean, I'm furious, okay? I was I was so pissed off. Was yeah, so you were so close to a 4-0 week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Need, needed a 4-0 week. Really, really angry, really upset. But, I, you know, I at the end of the day, I do understand. These, these guys are college kids. In the pro game, that's a little different because you're paid to know about all these scenarios. Currently, these guys are not compensated, and so therefore, I, I just, I just get it. I'm gonna give him a pass. I, you know, I'd, I'd like my fifty bucks back, but you know, if 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 some booster slips him a Lincoln, you know, send him my way. I'll open the Venmo up, <laughs> and, uh, and we'll call this fair. I, I understand the the uh, the desire to do that. Like, yeah, that makes sense to me. All right, you ready to move on number eight? Oh, yeah. Number eight. You can fly through these however you want to do it. BYU 30, USC 27 in overtime. BYU's defense confused uh, Slovis enough to to get three interceptions out of him. 
One of them in overtime. USC, 452 yards against that defense. BYU had 430 yards against USC. This was actually a fun game to watch. I, I had this on the iPad for a little while. Yep. Um, Slovis throwing that pick in overtime after BYU hit that field goal, it, it wasn't a terrible read or anything like that. He just never saw the guy. He was yeah. confused, and that's what you're going to get out of freshman quarterback sometimes. BYU looks pretty good right now. I mean, it would this is this has a chance of being a eight and four, nine and three kind of football team. Uh, that that kid Zach Wilson, the quarterback, real deal, man. He is a tough sob. Like I enjoy watching him. I think that uh, I think that's a pretty good football team. And this is about exactly what I expected USC to be, right? They're going to play really well at home sometimes. They're not going to play so well on the road. They're not going to look great against good teams. But and that, I think that means that Stanford's probably not a very good football team. But, Agreed. man, USC is probably a 6-6, six and 7-5 six, and five kind of football team just based on the schedule that they play. So I've got no analysis on this game whatsoever other than yesterday morning, you and I had a lengthy text conversation where I send you uh, the first thing I do, I get on, and I've already got some plays from the week from when we make gambling picks and yeah. things that I've liked and don't like. And I'm looking online and thinking, where am I going to make my bets today? What what games are coming up that I didn't play? And I saw on Vegas Insider that 83% of the bets were coming in on the under in this game. And the line moved eight points up. Yeah, from, not down from forty. They what? went over forty. Oh, I'd have to find the text message because I sent it all to you. I think it was like forty-seven, and it moved up to like fifty-five or something. It moved, it moved to fifty-six and a half. It was 56. a half point, whatever it was. It was eight points difference, and it stopped at fifty-six and a half. And and I told you, I said there is some chicanery. To use the <laughs> f word in that. To to, to this. This doesn't make sense. Vegas does not make this mistake, and it's across the board. Every sports book you look for, it's not one place got hammered, and so they have to move it to get action the other way or, or anything like that. Every book you find moved it eight points up, and 83% of the money and the bets were coming in on the under. There is something not right here. All I wanted, all I thought about that day was I want to take the under in this game. I think both of these defenses are going to play well. I think it's going to be a lower scoring game. But when you see that line moving up. And I saw that and I was like, nope. I, I, I'm just going to go with the house. I'm going to blindly go against what I think and I'm just going to bet with Vegas. I did this in the South Carolina game week one. It, it cost me against North Carolina. But, but this is eight points the other way. This is not one and a half points. This is a massive line movement against major, major action going against the house. Vegas knew something. This is where the conspiracy theory comes out in me and says, what the hell? But it also means when I see that, just just hammer it. Yeah, just, just blindly hammer just it. Just blindly and hammer trust, it, and you'll, you'll come out as a winner. Those big, yeah, they yeah. don't trust those. They, they don't build those big buildings in Vegas for nothing. They yeah. don't build them off of winners, okay? Oh, I, so I, I like, I like going house. with the house. I, that's always the smartest play. Don't don't trust the public. I, the public will win sometimes. I, I have no idea how we were going to get to that number, but they were hitting fifty seven. I'd I'd have bet my kids on it. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, it just, yeah, you're right. Believe. I was let's, trying to figure out what happened. Let, let's move into number eight real quick. The American Athletic Conference making their Power Six case again. Yes, they're only four and ten against the Power Five right now. That is the the lower end of the conference, not the upper end. UCF absolutely put a beat down on Stanford, forty five to twenty seven, and it really wasn't that close. I mean, nope. this was a thirty eight to seven ball game. Stanford uh, got got garbage time points. Yeah, um, Temple, of course, we talked about that twenty to seventeen over number twenty one Maryland. And let me ask you this: so Memphis, of course, puts a beat down on South Alabama, who was able to hang with Nebraska, but. Is SMU actually pretty good? I mean, that this team is three and zero now. They have wiped out some some pretty decent, you know, group of five competition. Uh, you know, they've been great in the past. It's Sonny Dykes, I, mean, I think, has got this thing rolling right now. Yeah, no, they could they could absolutely be a contender here. And so, and then of course Washington State and Houston. 
You want to talk about some upset dudes. I was at Sam's Town on Friday night. This and game is I, nothing, nothing going into halftime? Th- this game, and, and it, I left you know early second quarter, but the over-under is 74 and a half in this game. And when you see guys that have hundreds of dollars, if not more, riding yeah, on an over between these two coaches, and it is nothing to nothing, you will hear words you have never heard spoken in your life. All those people are suckers, man. Oh, They're yeah. Suckers. This was one of those situations, again, we talked about this, me and you did, uh, that that it's just everybody was on the over. I guarantee you it's not happening. Yeah. Well, the other side of it, so everybody thinks, oh, they're friends, they're both offensive gurus, they're going to want to show out for each other. Da, da, da. Or it could mean that they both know the other person's playbook. Mike Leach so, <laughs> taught, taught him everything he knows yes. about how to run this offense. I mean, it's he just knows ridiculous. How to stop it. I promise you, he knows the kill switch. He knows where it's at. Yes, he most certainly does. Uh, number 10. I found it really fun yep. to watch, though, right? Like, oh, I still really fun. like this game, even because you and I are not afraid of defense. We, I, I like this game a lot. Yeah. No, I, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, I stayed up and watching the whole thing. I love both of these coaches. You know that, though. Oh, so. I, uh, of course I do. Uh, Dana Holgerson's got the best hair in the business, and Mike Leach is the best storyteller in the business. So. Oh, no. Love these guys. If uh, Rather than watch the game, I'd rather just watch those two talking. I think that would have <laughs> been put, better. Put me on a boat with, with limit, unlimited amounts of booze. In those two guys, I'm the happiest dude alive. Hey, you believe that. Next up, number 10, superstars putting up big numbers again. And now I know that this, again, kind of a slow week. There's probably some other games that we could talk about. But let's talk about the superstars of the sport that everybody talks about for the Heisman and everything else. Tua, 28 out of 36, 444 yards, five touchdowns, zero picks. Uh, that is a school record for passing yardage in a game. Five touchdowns, that ties the school record at Alabama. Zero interceptions. Uh, he has just been absolutely lights out phenomenal this year, and it is what it is, right? Jalen Hurts on the other side, 15 out of 20 for Oklahoma in a big 48-14 to win in the Rose Bowl. 289 yards, three touchdowns. He had 14 runs for 150 yards and another touchdown. Clemson, let's talk about Trevor Lawrence. He put up some stats. 22 out of 39, had 395 yards. He had three touchdowns. He had two more interceptions, though. Uh, four runs for 42 yards and one touchdown. Did you did you watch him talking a little trash to Syracuse yeah, when he was going in for that run? Yeah. Just no reason for it. Like You're so much better than these guys. Why? Why continue to do that? He does it every game. Yeah. I know, and and he and he plays such a cupcake schedule. I yes. swear to God, it's a, it, it, you. You almost Any, feel it feels like he's a bully. You know? any, anybody, anybody who wants to who wants to cry about UCS schedule, please shut your mouth if you're going to blow up Clemson. Just yeah. shut your mouth. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Justin Fields was 14 out of 24 for 199 yards, three touchdowns. He had four runs for 11 yards and one touchdown, and then. This is the the thing that won the ball game for Ohio State. I mean, they absolutely dismantled Indiana, fifty one to ten. Ohio State put up over three hundred yards rushing. J.K. Dobbins was unstoppable in this game, just ridiculous. All right, let's wrap up with uh, with this last game here. Kansas oh, whoa, State. You want to talk about all those dudes? You're not going to talk about my boy. You want to talk about what Joe Burrow? Man, he played. Oh, yeah. No, no, move on. He no, played Northwestern on. State. Who we talked about Burrow play? last week. Who the, hang on. Who did Trevor Lawrence play? Syracuse. A team that just got boathoused by, <laughs> by. These are all guys that we haven't talked about much this by year Maryland. Because, because they haven't you know played why? anybody. Because I play nobody. That, <laughs> What what were the stats on on? No no we're uh, fine move on move on. No actually we're hey done. let's let's do talk about no. this. Let's, no let's, we're done. No 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 let's talk about Burrow for two seconds I think here. We should move on because I, I assure you that team that they played would give UCLA all they want all they want. <laughs> that team that LSU beat the hell out of would give Syracuse all they want right now. We'll, I, we'll see. I mean I I don't know. No man. we won't see because those teams won't schedule them. No they but they, but they're terrible. So. Tell me this, and I haven't looked it up. I do want to see, though. 
Is Joe Burrow really at 83% completion percentage on the season? You got damn right he is. I mean, that six, uh, 83% on the season? Hang on. I'm getting there. I'm going to give you his numbers today. That that actually is not who, A, I thought you were going to include him, and so I, I was a little annoyed you didn't. The guy I thought you should include, the dude that's back, the star that was the star that's been reborn, is Khalil Tate, our guy. You know what? Uh and you didn't give those numbers out. Now, his passing wasn't great, but he's back to like 150, 160 yards rushing TDs, just running it down people's throats. No one could catch him. That's who I thought you were going to. The whole reason I thought you did that segment was to get back to say, and Khalil Tate, because he's a superstar so, in this league. So, look, Khalil Tate, no, 14 out of 23. You're the reason we talk about Alabama because they ain't played nobody. And so every week we got to find a way to throw them in when they don't play nobody. So, they Joe played Burrow. on the road at Joe South Burrow. Carolina. It's the same thing as Jalen going to play UCLA and Trevor Lawrence going to play Clemson. It's the yeah, same they thing. used to play. They played somebody's. Yeah, they, but they, but they when I talk about the superstars of the sport, this is the the college game day. Like these are the dudes that everybody brings up for the Heisman Trophy. Khalil Tate ain't got no chance to win the Heisman Trophy. Went fourteen out of twenty three, one hundred eighty five yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. He had seventeen carries, one hundred twenty nine yards, and one touchdown. Uh, but w- I will say this: 129 yards. You're just gonna poo-poo that rushing? Come on, man. When, when is the last time that Kevin Sumlin actually outcoached somebody in the fourth quarter? Last night. That well, uh, before last night. Oh, when he was at Texas A&M, sometime. It probably Alabama. when Johnny Manziel was there. Yep. Yep. I I mean, it, what he did last night was pretty freaking remarkable. Um, Joe Burrow, sir. Joe Burrow. 21 from 24 attempts, 373 yards, two TDs. One pick. Joe one Burrow, pick. seven rushes, 30 yards, rushes, and one touchdown. 30 yards and a touchdown. But hold on. Here's here's his season stats, right? So, Miles Brennan, who backs him up, was eight out of nine for 115 yards as well. Um, but Joe Burrow, let's see, 2019 – he is 54 out of 66 for 82% completion percentage, 749 yards, nine touchdowns, one pick. It's pretty remarkable. That's it's it's 75 for 90 and it's 83.3. Where are you saying that? Oh, this doesn't include last night. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Sorry. It's ESPN didn't it had an update. I, I accept your apology. Had an update. But yeah, Joe Burrow looking like the real deal. Looking like the real deal. He's trying to find ways to fit in Alabama. I get it. Oh, I even on, put the man. red up for you. Because of it. <laughs> yeah, I even went with the red just for you. And I do appreciate that. No, it was it was nice to see yesterday. It was it was nice to see Alabama get a win. Feels like it's been so long. <laughs> uh, let's close out with this one. Um, Kansas State thirty one, Mississippi State twenty four. And I, I tossed this on at the end, one, to get us up to 11, because we always want to do our, our starting 11 every week. But this was an interesting game. And I wanted to bring it up because I think you and I were really wrong about Kansas State. Oh, yeah. No question about that. Um, I mean, this was, this was interesting. Like, they – neither team could throw the football. And I think that's actually going to work in Kansas State's favor uh, going into Big 12 play. Um, Kansas State, 123 yards passing. Mississippi State, 151 yards passing with two interceptions. Tommy Stevens got knocked out of the game. Both teams had three turnovers. Mississippi uh, Mississippi State backup quarterback Garrett Schrader, terrible decision. And I understand he's young. I I get that. Terrible decision making down the stretch. Hey, uh, lots of freshmen played Saturday. Lots yeah. of them did. They and didn't look this bad. Okay. No, uh, we we were just we were so wrong on Kansas State. And you know I, who I was right on? You know who I, I was right on? By the you way, you were right on Mississippi State. I was I was right I was right about Joe Moorhead being a bad hire. I was I was right about waiting and rushing the hire process because two weeks from when they needed to hire a guy, when they hired a guy, was this this arbitrary made up rule about uh, early signing. And we got to have a head coach for early signing day because we won't get these recruits if we don't have a head coach for early signing day when none of the big guys are signing on early signing day anyway. And, and so, so they rushed it and they, and 
the good news is, the good news is they almost ended up with Jeremy Pruitt because, yeah. and they could be Tennessee right now. They they rushed it. They interviewed three people, and after every interview, they offered the job to all three people, and and they didn't follow their process. They started with the process. They had a list of about seven names, and they didn't even finish the interviews. They just they just interviewed one, and it wasn't that their first choice was was who they interviewed in order they interviewed these people as they became available and the last two guys that were on the list of course like three or four of them didn't get interviewed but these two specifically said i'm not interviewing until after the bowl game i just want to coach my team in a bowl game and they didn't get interviewed you know what you rushed it you hired a guy that i don't think is qualified and i don't think he's going to do well and I was, I've been very open and honest about that, and I feel vindicated so far to this point. Joe yeah. Moorhead will be a bust at Mississippi State, and in two years, they'll be looking for a new coach. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, two years? You give them that long? Yeah. No, I've, I've watched Mississippi State fans last pretty long. Pretty long with yeah. some pretty bad coaches, yeah. Bad coaches. You're, that, you're right. That is, a school, that is a school that does not like firing people and paying them. No, they, they will wait until your contract is over to pay you. That is a very, very good point. Very good point. All right. That is going to wrap up the show. As always, you run over to winningcureseverything.com. Follow us on social media. You can follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. You can follow Chris, at Chris B. Giannini. You can follow the show, at Winning Cures. Make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, any of your favorite podcast apps. Subscribe on YouTube. Leave some comments. Guys, this has been fun. We will talk NFL tomorrow. Chris, let's go watch some uh, some NFL games. <laughs>